Zachary Bubli is a history PhD student. He is a specialist in World War I aces. Today, he talks about first air fights and their heroes. Hello everybody, welcome aboard this lesson about the heroes of the air in the Great War between 1914 and 1918. My name is Zachary Boubli, I'm a history teacher specialized in the history of aeronautics during World War I. And I'll be your captain today uh, for you to learn about how military, killer plane, fighting, dying in the war came to be part of aviation with the tremendous role of World War I as a catalyzer. We will have a course in three parts. First, we will see how uh, aircrafts come to be weaponized, how a machine uh, that's first designed uh, primarily to fly comes to be a machine that fights. Then, uh, in a second episode, we'll talk about how the air war itself, with its practices, its doctrine, uh, its culture, became invented during World War One. And finally, in a final third episode, we will talk about the heroic figures that emerged thanks to this conflict. First, we're gonna have to talk about the weaponizing of aircrafts, how this machine came to be something that you use for war and not for something else. You probably know that uh, aviation uh, takes a tremendous leap forward uh, around the years 1907 and 1908 with the first flights of the Wright brothers. Uh, these flights come at a moment in which uh, airplanes are not at all the only machine that flies. Uh, in the, ever since the late 18th century, you had uh, balloons, hot air balloons, uh, hydrogen balloons, uh, that came to be uh, perfected all along the 19th century, uh, and became uh, something that you can actually uh, that you can actually direct something that you can uh, actually that can actually stay in the air for hours or even days something that relies on the principle of being lighter than air airplanes work on the on the on the idea that it's heavier than hair it's heavier than hair but it's propelled by an engine and uh, there's enough technological progress to be able to make engines powerful enough to propel a plane in the air and that's what happens uh, in the first decade of the 20th century, in the Belle Époque, with the Wrights brothers. Aviation starts to develop as a sport. Uh, there is a huge, tremendous public uh, passion for aviation, starting uh, mostly in France. Uh, we, could, we could talk about that for hours, for instance, about Monsieur Santos Dumont, the Brazilian-French uh, dandy, who invented uh, this specific model called La Demoiselle uh, and who used to amaze Parisians by flying over Paris around the Eiffel Tower, etc., etc. And within a couple months, uh, the progresses of aviation after, after the first flight of the Wrights became exponential. And very quickly, you started to have different constructors, different companies making different uh, aircraft models and using uh, the power and the fascination that these uh, exerted on the public in order to promote aviation. Here you have uh, the, the poster announcing the Grande Semaine de l'Aviation de la Champagne, the Great Aviation Week in the Champagne region, took place in 1909. And you can see that there are 200,000 francs offered as prizes because it's a way to make a career. You can make a career as a pilot if you're exceptionally gifted, if you're exceptionally daredevil, and you can make a career as a plane constructor because these meetings will be the occasion to showcase your model, to prove that it's better than others. And if the pilot you've been sponsoring and that flies your machine actually wins one of the contests, that means more money funneled into your company in order to make more planes. So aviation starts as a sport, something that sportsmen do, uh, because we are the, at a moment in which sports, uh, as we as we know them today, sports as popular passions are born. And uh, the same people that will uh, read about uh, tennis, go to see soccer games, uh, golf tournaments, uh, the first Olympics in Paris in 1904. These are the same people that will go to see an air meeting 
away from Paris, of course, in the Champagne region, for instance, because it's very easy to organize an air meeting. All you need is a vast field, and that's about it because the planes are going to are coming by flying, obviously, and the people can just uh, can just be in the grass looking at the planes. In this contest, uh, most part were uh, most of the contestants were civilian pilots, but you also had military pilots, including this one, Captain Ferdinand Ferber. You can see on the picture that uh, he is also known as the name De Rue, which was his pseudonym for uh, taking part in air contests. Why? Because uh, the French military back then uh, started as a very conservative institution, uh, an institution in which innovation was uh, kind of suspicious, but it was also an army that was eager to prepare for uh, facing Germany and an army in which a bunch of people would believe in aviation and would be eager to uh, try it out by themselves, like Ferdinand Ferber. Ferdinand Ferber, so he had he won prizes, but under his uh, under his pseudonym, although everybody knew he was uh, a military man. And Ferber also remained in history as the first air military casualty. He died in 1909 after an accident in which this, his plane basically uh, caught up on one side and uh, collapsed on the airfield and uh, the engine crushed uh, poor Ferber to death. And it's something that's very, very early on part of aviation culture. The idea that uh, aviation is something dangerous, something that can uh, quite easily kill you. After all, uh, a plane uh, in the beginning of the 20th century is something very uh, precarious. It's a machine literally made of wood and cloth and a, binge, a bunch of metal threads, but that's about it. It's something that you can't fly if uh, the weather doesn't allow it. Something that uh, can suffer a malfunction at any time. And thus, death is uh, viewed as the universal passenger of aircrafts. The military aviation, uh, so the military aviation kind of coexisted in the mind of uh, aviation pioneers with uh, civilian aviation, and the two uh, the two domains uh, were not thought as separate. Some people would advocate for the fact that aviation would be a vector for peace uh, because, after all, it erases borders, uh, it gives uh, the pilot the spectacle of. Uh, the world uh, beneath him with this beauty of uh, something natural that you don't want uh, to destroy but uh, especially in france that was uh, that had his eyes locked on uh, the german border uh, preparing for decades the next war with germany many many people thought of aviation as a key factor in a future war with germany for that private sponsorship private patronage came uh, to play a uh, not so unexpected role, especially with the Michelin company. You might think of Michelin as uh, just a company that makes tires, which uh, to some extent is true, but it's not only that. It's a company that makes uh, the civilization of engines. Uh, for instance, you may know the Guide Michelin, at least us French people know it very well. The Guide Michelin is uh, simply a booklet, uh, very uh, often updated, of uh, telling you where to eat, where to stop with your car. Meaning that Michelin will sell you uh, the tires uh, that, that will uh, make your car run, but not only, it will also sell you uh, the knowledge of knowing what to do with your car. And Michelin was also supplying tires uh, for the aircraft industry and uh, thus took an interest, a patriotic interest, as they viewed it, into developing uh, the military use of aviation. Uh, for that, uh, the, the first lead uh, was uh, air bombing. Uh, everybody would start to have fantasies about being able to destroy enemy cities uh, from the air, and thus Michelin would organize the Aero-Cible contest. The Aero-Cible contest had uh, huge prizes, and uh, they were to be given to any pilot who would be able to uh, throw a stone of a certain weight and size into a target from a given height. 
and Michelin also took advantage of the French advance in sports aviation because prior to World War I, France is un undoubtedly the country of aviation, the country with the pilots, the most con constructors, and uh, the most, uh, the biggest popular interest in aviation. And you can see that the Aero Cible uh, even gave way to postcards. This, uh, this is not a poster, it's a postcard, uh, promoting the use of airplanes to uh, destroy things from the sky. So the French military, the French military uh, was still quite uh, doubtful about aviation, uh, especially since uh, they were uh, quite in advance in terms of using other balloons. Uh, although uh, they they were very uh, worried about the development of German zeppelins, and there was uh, the decisive role of this man, Colonel Charles Tricorneau de Rose, in the development of French military aviation. French military aviation was first an object of dispute between uh, the Genie uh, part of the military and the artillery part of the military. Uh, the artillery, for instance, claiming that they were already using air balloons uh, to uh, monitor uh, their, um, their shooting in order to check that they actually hit the target because at, uh, the te gun technology allows you to have cannons that fire beyond the line of horizon. And so they were among uh, the first one interested in developing aviation. Charles Tricorneau de Rose uh, also created the process uh, for uh, military certification of pilot. Uh, he obtained the first military pilot license ever given by uh, the French military. And uh, that was after uh, obtaining his civilian uh, pilot license, meaning that there was this idea that you are supposed to develop an elite Corp of pilots uh, to prepare the future war, something that uh, Tricorne de Rose did and is still today regarded as the father of the French fighting aviation, but that will be for episode two. Another pioneer of military aviation, less in the less in terms of uh, something that you actually get done, but much much more important in terms of strategic thinking, is this man, uh, Giulio Due. He's not French; he is Italian and he is uh, widely regarded as the first theorist of air power, uh, inventing concepts such as strategic bombing, with this idea that bombers will always pass, and air supremacy, meaning the ability to deny your opponents access and use of the third dimension. Uh, Giulio Due uh, got into trouble for his ideas, uh, he even uh, took, spent some time in jail during World War I, nevertheless, uh, he is the father of the Italian uh, strategic bombing doctrine and uh, played and was, uh, really, was very much read during the interwar, especially in fascist Italy, but not only. So after uh, the first attempts uh, prior to uh, World War I, uh, airplanes uh, were eager uh, to be used in an actual conflict. The first occasion occurred uh, in the first... Uh, the first air bombing occurred uh, in the 1st of November 1911 in the war between the Kingdom of Italy and the Ottoman Empire, uh, the war that would lead to Italy taking over the province of Libya. Uh, during this war, uh, the Italians made the first use of uh, the couple uh, airplanes that the military had acquired, uh, especially to uh, convey reconnaissance, uh, reconnaissance raids in order to spot uh, enemy columns marching towards Italian armies. And it's also at this occasion that the first actual air bombing of history took place. Uh, it was made by Giulio Gavotti, the man that you see on the picture, using a Blériot 11, not the plane on the picture. Uh, the Blériot 11 is a one-decker, the one that uh, Blériot used to uh, cross the English Channel. And Giulio Gavotti threw four grenades uh, from uh, above on, uh, on an oasis in which Ottoman troops were resting. There were absolutely no casualties because uh, it's very difficult to aim from such a height and uh, a grenade uh, won't do much damage unless you manage to actually land it on the very people you're targeting. So 
uh, after this first uh, attempt, uh, it was widely regarded as promising and that gave fuel to uh, the ones in uh, respective uh, militaries that were advocating for uh, the country to uh, build up an air force. And it's something that will be catalyzed, will be accelerated decisively by World War I. In Italy, uh, there was also by World War I. Nevertheless, aviation was already in the minds before uh, being actual realizations. Uh, you can see that Julio Douai talks about strategic bombing uh, years before uh, actually seeing a plane that is capable of uh, conducting strategic bombing. And uh, this fascination, which uh, was at the core of the public's interest for aviation, also led other artists to put uh, the spectacle of flight at the very center of their conception of modernity. The Futurist movement in Italy, founded by Filippo Marinetti, uh, is the perfect embodiment of that with this fascination for uh, speed, uh, violence, engines, noise, uh, straight lines, angles that planes convey. And in the interwar, uh, this futurist will uh, be very much spoiled by Mussolini, who will let them develop what they call aeropittura, air painting. Nevertheless, uh, let's jump to the summer of 1914. You know that uh, the you know that it starts with uh, murdered uh, Archduk in Bosnia Herzegovina, and leading to uh, the triggering of uh, the mechanic of World War One, a mechanic with, which will uh, very quickly involve all of Europe and other parts of the world into the war, and a mechanic with, which will uh, sorry a dynamic which will uh, very quickly draw aviation sportsmen into war. Um, a, bef a good example of that is Marc Pourp. Marc Pourp uh, was uh, the son of a very famous prostitute uh, under the, third, the French Third Republic, uh, started out as a mechanic for a pilot and ended up flying the, machine, the machines himself. He won several prizes. Uh, you know, records, raids, etc., etc. Uh, he was among the first uh, men to fly uh, over over Egypt uh, in the African skies and uh, over uh, the Indochina sky in Southeast Asia. And uh, just like the other members of the elites of pilots, the Aero Club de France, Marc Pourp volunteered for uh, service uh, to the military in World War One. Uh, and he volunteered as a pilot, offering his personal plane to the military for them to make good use of it. Of course, uh, these aviation sportsmen were expecting to conduct heroic uh, missions, uh, you know, uh, dangerous, rec rec uh, dangerous uh, range recognition uh, missions. Uh, they were expecting to be able to send paratroopers behind the lines, etc., etc. They were hoping for a very exalting war, just like many people were uh, in the summer of 1914, but they soon got disillusioned. Uh, they got disillusioned because uh, when uh, a civilian pilot came into the military, he first had to uh, certify that he had the level to be a military pilot, meaning that you can be an experienced pilot, you've been flying for years, uh, you've been acclaimed by crowds, uh, you've won medals, you've uh, set records, etc., etc., and all of a sudden, you find yourself in a barrack having to uh, do uh, basic physical training and having to uh, start over learning how to fly to get your military license. Something that was very frustrating for the sportsmen. But that's not the worst because uh, what happens to them is that many, many of them get killed in the war. Here you can see Marc, Pourp, Marc Pourp's plane after his demise, which occurred in December 1914. So just a couple months after the beginning of the war, aviation was already mourning a bunch of losses from the war. And uh, this is very uh, emblematic of the shift of aviation, which came from being something primarily, primarily used for sport, uh, something that conveys dreams uh, into something that you use for war and something that has to be engineered to be most efficient at killing. But that will be our next episode. Thank you very much. 
Hello, everybody. Welcome to the second part of this lesson about the heroes of uh, the air in the Great War, 1914-1918. My name is still Zachary Gouli, and we'll talk today about the invention of the air war, how uh, through uh, individual experimentations, initiatives, and improvisations, World War I uh, gave birth to uh, the first practices, uh, structured practices of the war in the air. So we had left uh, last time with uh, aviator Marc Pourp, an example of uh, these sportsmen that uh, get decimated uh, during the war. Uh, and indeed, uh, this uh, not entirely, but this generation, but mostly, most of the generation of pilots will be killed in uh, all along the war. We can also give uh, the example of Adjudant Dupré, who was a very, very famous uh, sportsman prior to the war. Uh, you can see Diabolo, uh, the Diabolo that you can see uh, on the back right of the picture. Uh, that was painted on his plane, and you can also see that he met his tragic fate, him, he also, uh, him too, during World War I. So, uh, a decisive role of the development of the air war will be played, nevertheless, by a sportsman, this man, Roland Garros. And we'll have uh, lots of time to talk about him, but first, let's talk about uh, the concepts of the war in the air. So, uh, after the start of World War I, uh, you know that armies uh, set, huge armies uh, set themselves uh, in motion, uh, be it in France, in Germany, in Russia, in Austria, in, it, in the Ottoman Empire, etc., etc. And what happens is that uh, in the first weeks of the war, uh, before the war would uh, descend into the static trench warfare, uh, back uh, in the early World War I, the moment uh, regarded as a movement uh, phase, planes played a decisive role on two battles, one on the Eastern Front and one on the Western Front. On the Eastern Front, uh, in which the Germans and the Austrians were uh, bracing themselves uh, against, uh, the, against uh, the Russian war machine, uh, airplane recognitions helps uh, win the Battle of Tannenberg. This battle was decisive uh, in the sense that uh, airplanes uh, managed to figure that uh, the two Russian armies that the Germans were up against uh, were separate from each other, and uh, the, planes were, the plane was able to locate them very precisely, thus enabling uh, the German command to uh, defeat those two Russian army one after another, and thus uh, freezing the war on the Eastern Front uh, since the Russian threat uh, was temporarily halted. On the Western Front, uh, airplanes played a decisive role in the Bataille de la Marne. The Bataille de la Marne uh, is regarded by the French as uh, the moment in which uh, the German advance stopped, which is uh, mostly true. Basically, what happened is that uh, the German plan was to uh, have a, a scythe-like movement in order to surround, uh, surround the French and British uh, armies and uh, take Paris by uh, besieging it. But uh, von Kluck, the German commander, figured that he didn't have enough troops to uh, surround both Paris and uh, the Allied armies. So uh, it took a turn uh, towards uh, the south, uh, effectively avoiding Paris and offering his flanks to uh, the French military, something that was spotted by uh, French planes. Uh, which led to uh, the Allies counter-attacking against the Germans and thus driving them away from approaching Paris. Uh, the Bataille de la Marne uh, would not be uh, the end of the war by far. Uh, on the contrary, it's actually the opposite. It's the beginning of uh, the freezing of the war into uh, the trench warfare. Nevertheless, the war has started and planes are already showing the use that you can make of them. The first use that you can make of a plane is the fact that it's an eye in the sky, meaning that you can spot uh, enemy columns much, much more effectively than uh, what you used for uh, battlefield um, as, uh, recognition prior to uh, having an aviation. Uh, you can actually, uh, because before that you used uh, the cavalry, 
which has a limited interest uh, in that matter. You could also use uh, hot air balloons, but uh, they're very slow and very easily spotted, whereas a plane can uh, just very quickly fly over a region and report on troop movements in it. Uh, having eyes in the sky is just uh, useful uh, to spot the enemy, but it's not the only use. Remember that we talked about artillery. So back then, uh, cannons can shoot uh, beyond the horizon, meaning that uh, it's very useful to have an eye in the sky, be it a balloon or an airplane, uh, in order to monitor the target and communicate uh, you uh, about the need of correcting the trajectory of the aim. Something that you can do with uh, color flags, uh, movements of uh, the, uh, the aircraft, or even using the telegraphy sans fil, the first radio uh, on board the planes. Now, since uh, this, since there is uh, a tremendous uh, use, tremendous strategic role of aviation as an eye in the sky, that means that uh, for an army, it's uh, very important to be able not only to use uh, the sky uh, to uh, look to the enemy, but uh, it's also crucial to be able to chase the enemy away from the sky. Something called air supremacy is the ability to deny your opponent the use of the third dimension. Uh, finally, uh, the third use of uh, aviation during uh, World War I would be uh, bombing, but uh, it's uh, usually regarded as a minor part of the topic, uh, which is why we won't talk much about uh, bombing. Uh, the bottom line is that Air bombings uh, in World War I uh, can't be carried with uh, enough uh, material, enough bombs uh, to make a strategic impact. And it's more about uh, destroying a railway or a stock or a barrack uh, somewhere near the front line for the psychological effect it will have rather than uh, the actual tactical effect. So uh, let's regard um, airfield recognition and um, air supremacy, which would lead to the development of fighting aviation as the two core cores of what aviation does during the war. So uh, in, the match, in the regard of air supremacy, it is very important basically to be able to take down enemy's planes from the sky. For that, uh, several methods can be employed. The first one ever employed, uh, the first air to air victory, uh, was used on the uh, was used in the first weeks of World War One by a guy called Piotr Nesterov, a Russian pilot. A tactic called the Taran, which basically means battering ram in English, in Russian. Uh, it's a very useful uh, and efficient technique uh, because it consists in throwing your planes in the enemy's plane, and if it works, you're pretty much guaranteed to uh, take down the enemy but it can only work once, since, as you can imagine, Nesterov did not survive his time. So other uh, means less costly in uh, human lives had to be uh, found, and that's where those two men come into play. Uh, on the Western Front, uh, the front on which aviation was uh, much more uh, developed, uh, especially since the French military viewed uh, heavier than hair airplanes as uh, the perfect antidote to uh, German zeppelins. On the Western Front, uh, aviators would, would very uh, early uh, bring guns or bricks or stones or anything that you can throw at uh, your enemy in order to destroy their plane in the air. For instance, you'll try to uh, uh, throw a brick in order to smash the enemy's rotor or uh, to make a hole in uh, his plane uh, in the hope of bringing them down, uh, or uh, at least making them having to flee the battlefield. Uh, but a decisive step, step was crossed by these two men on the 5th of October 1914. These are Joseph Franz on the left uh, as a pilot and Louis Queneau as a mechanic. Uh, these two men knew each other uh, before the war because Joseph Franz uh, was a sportsman pilot and Keno was his mechanic and also a try, try out pilot uh, or other uh, tasks. And the two men were eager to uh, take the, to 
take the fight from the, the they witnessed on land into the air. Uh, so, in order to do that, uh, they first started by uh, bringing uh, a rifle on board and very quickly had the idea of uh, building a fixed uh, machine gun into the plane. It was a two-man uh, plane, a B plus, uh, and uh, it was uh, very clear from the very beginning that Keno, the passenger, would be the one maneuvering and shooting the uh, rifle, while Joseph Hans was the one piloting the plane. So they went to see uh, their commanding officer and uh, told him about their idea of putting a machine gun on the plane. The officer uh, dismissed the idea, calling it ridiculous. So they had to resort to, once again, private initiative by going to see Gabriel Voisin. Gabriel Voisin was the one uh, that designed and uh, built the plane uh, that they were uh, flying. And Voisin was very enthusiastic about uh, mounting a machine gun on the plane. And Voisin helped them, uh, leading them in the 5th of October 1914 to take down an aviatic plane over the skies of Champagne. And this is recorded as the first air tour actual victory in which well, the pilots survive. Uh, so this allowed uh, the French military to uh, be able to chase away a bunch of German planes, but keep in mind that this is the beginning of the war and uh, all armies in Europe uh, don't have 1,000 planes if you uh, combine them all, meaning that it's very seldom uh, to encounter an enemy uh, plane and even more seldom to be able to uh, get close enough to shoot at them, especially since uh, you have two men in the plane, meaning that the one maneuvering the plane is not the one firing the gun, which can give lots of synchronization uh, issues and poses another problem, a very obvious one. Since the shooter uh, can point to the back of the plane, uh, it's uh, quite delicate to, be, to chase down uh, someone and then pivot uh, to be able to shoot at them from the back. So other solutions had to be explored. And this is where Roland Garros comes into play. Roland Garros was a sports fanatic. Uh, before the, in the years before the war, he tried every sport possible. Uh, he, tried, uh, he tried soccer, he tried rugby, he tried racing, he tried cycling, he tried tennis, obviously, and uh, he tried uh, automobile racing, and his last passion was aviation. And uh, just like he had done in uh, many other sports, he set up many, many records uh, in aviation, won uh, several prizes, and was uh, regarded as the superstar of aviation. Roland Garros was frustrated with uh, Franz and Keno's uh, solution because as a pilot, he was very eager to uh, be able to maneuver the gun uh, himself. And he was aware that uh, one passenger planes, the une place, the monoplace, are, uh, would be much more efficient as uh, fighting planes since they're very fast and uh, can do lots of acrobatic maneuvering. So Garros started to work uh, on a way to have uh, a machine gun uh, in a one-man uh, plane and uh, his hope was to be able to shoot forward. That way the pilot could very easily be the one doing the maneuvering, the aiming and the shooting. Uh, he, Given the size of the rotor of uh, the planes back then, it was uh, quite delicate to imagine to mount a machine gun that would shoot forward, but to build it uh, over, above uh, the, the rotor. So Gauss's solution was to embrace the fact that if uh, you have the machine gun uh, pointing towards, the, towards the, the front, some bullets will eventually uh, hit uh, the rotor. But uh, he calculated that only one in three or four uh, bullets would actually hit the, the, the rotor, the propeller, uh, meaning that uh, he mounted uh, metal deflectors on uh, the rotor on the spots that were to be hit, and, uh, hit by uh, the bullets, uh, thus reinforcing uh, the rotor and allowing it to uh, uh, be an effective uh, machine of war. Uh, he mounted the Hotchkiss uh, machine gun on his plane that was in January 1915. And soon enough, within a couple of weeks, he managed to take down three, uh, sorry, two German planes from the sky. 
Unfortunately, uh, Garros uh, was captured, uh, his plane uh, damaged, and he was forced uh, to land in uh, German-controlled uh, territory. He did not manage to set fire to his plane prior to being captured, and hence his system was uh, studied by the Germans. The Germans uh, brought uh, his system to Anthony Fokker, a Dutch engineer who was the father of uh, German military aviation in World War One. And Fokker found the uh, Garros system interesting, but uh, inefficient. Uh, so he did not copy it. Uh, he just carried on on inventing something better that he was already working on. And uh, Fokker's solution was uh, something that would synchronize uh, the movement of the rotor with uh, the machine gun and that would detect uh, the moment in which the rotor would be in front of the machine gun, thus uh, stopping uh, the machine gun from shooting when the rotor is in front, meaning that you don't have to work, you can shoot forward and not have to worry about uh, breaking your rotor. Uh, and uh, this coupled with the fact that uh, German machine guns had much more ammo and were less likely to jam uh, made the war in the air a reality starting in the spring of 1915. In the spring, uh, the first uh, air victories uh, were uh, won uh, as, uh, as a chain, and that's when the first ace of the war came to be, Adolf Pegu. Adolf Pegu was yet another uh, aviation sportsman uh, that had become a superstar before uh, the war. Uh, his specialty was uh, air acrobacy. He would be among the first one to do loopings. Uh, he would be uh, among the first one to jump from a plane with a parachute. Um, and uh, Pegu would uh, entertain uh, foot soldiers in World War I, train soldiers, uh, by uh, doing loopings above the trenches. And Pegu uh, uh, started using Garros's invention, which very quickly equipped uh, the entire French uh, aviation uh, on the one uh, on the one passenger engines, and uh, Pegu uh, managed to win six uh, confirmed air victories between March 1915 and uh, the end of August uh, of the same year. Uh, on the 30 on the 31st of August, he was unfortunately uh, taken down uh, by a German pilot. Uh, rumors uh, said that uh, this is due to his machine gun jamming. And this was his six confirmed air victories. After his fifth uh, victory, since uh, five seems to be a symbolic number, the French press started to calling him As. As is ace uh, in, uh, in French, and I'm going to use the English word instead of the French word for very obvious reasons. And so, as the first ace, uh, Pegu made. Uh, uh, Pegu made other uh, pilots envious of his uh, glory, and thus uh, it was the beginning of a competition among pilots to be the one uh, winning the most victories, boasting about uh, the biggest uh, total of uh, enemy's plane taken down, leading to uh, the implementation of very strict rules in the French military to uh, confirm a kill in the air. Basically, in the French military, since uh, you have something to gain. Uh, at least symbolically and uh, also militarily, you're probably going to have a promotion or a decoration when you reach uh, the status of ace. Uh, very strict rules of uh, confirmation were implemented. Uh, you needed to be able to uh, show uh, the plane that you had taken down, and you needed to uh, have uh, several witnesses uh, of your victory. Uh, these are the rules in the French military. Uh, other rules uh, came to be precised uh, in other armies and were different. For instance, in the in the German military, uh, there was a tendency to overstate uh, vict the victories of the best pilots, especially uh, Manfred von Richthofen by the end of the war, the Red Baron, uh, who is believed to have been credited uh, of victories that were actually won by members of his squad. And in the British military, uh, unlike in the French military, uh, aces would not be uh, publicly uh, named, uh, they would not receive any official uh, recognition, and uh, aviation and winning victories was uh, more regarded as uh, a matter of sport 
uh, sports ethic, uh, gentleman's word, meaning that uh, when you claim a victory, uh, people will take you, take your world as, take your world as a gentleman, and only give you uh, personal uh, respect for that. But there is no official reward that you could expect from the British military. On the Western Front, uh, the year 1915 uh, was a year of skirmishes in the air. Uh, huge battles were attempted uh, on the land, but in the air, we are still at the at the step of skirmishes. Something that's going to change in 1916 with the Air Battle of Verdun. Verdun is uh, universally known as one of the toughest battles of uh, World War I, spanning from February to November 1916, uh, with hundreds of thousands of people killed. Verdun started as a, a German attempt to concentrate enough troops on a vulnerable sector of the French uh, defense lines in order to uh, force the French to uh, channel all their resources to defend Verdun and thus exhausting uh, the French military and compelling it to uh, file peace. Meaning that uh, in Verdun, uh, the shock, uh, the, the intense uh, German uh, shelling, uh, the huge wave of uh, troop attacks were matched in the sky by a huge concentration of German airplanes, which uh, drove Philippe Pétain, the French military commander of the Verdun battle, to ask Charles Tricorneau de Rose to clear up the sky uh, to uh, cure the, blind, the blindness uh, of the French military. And Tricorneau de Rose uh, started to organize the first uh, specialized uh, air fighting squads uh, in order to have uh, specialized squads uh, in which the best pilot uh, would uh, be pulled and uh, a squad that could be uh, sent to uh, whatever sector of the front needs it in order to clear the sky. And a decisive role into that, uh, something very emblematic, was done by Jean Navarre, the pilot that you can see here. Uh, Jean Navarre uh, was nicknamed La Sentinelle de Verdun, the guardian of uh, Verdun, for uh, his uh, huge role in taking down German planes. If you read uh, Christopher, uh, if you read uh, Tolkien's uh, Lord of the Rings, especially uh, Part Three. Uh, you can find uh, descriptions uh, of how uh, the noise of uh, the flying beasts uh, flown by the Nazgûls have a very frightening effect on the defenders of Minas Tirith. This is uh, something that Tolkien uh, drew from his personal experience as a trench soldier in World War I, uh, remembering how everybody was scared in the trench uh, just uh, over the sound of uh, an airplane. Uh, because it's regarded as a death that can come from above without you seeing it and without you being able to uh, retaliate. And thus, the foot soldiers were very, very uh, grateful to uh, the Allied pilots that would protect them from such a danger, that would also assert a French presence in the sky. So Jean Navarre uh, was the most active uh, fighter pilot during the Battle of Verdun. Uh, winning over uh, 20 uh, victories, also, although uh, his uh, actual total is probably much higher. Uh, but Jean Navarre seems to have little interest in uh, taking care of uh, his, his official score. And unfortunately for Jean Navarre, uh, his war ended in a tragedy since uh, his twin brother, Pierre Navarre, who was also a pilot, uh, was killed. And uh, Jean Navarre descended, fell into depression and uh, had to spend uh, the last two years of the war in a mental institution before dying in an airplane accident in 1919. Nevertheless, uh, with the Battle of Verdun, uh, the principle, the idea of air battle uh, with big uh, concentrations of planes was born, thus accelerating once again the, the specialization of aviation with different squads, uh, flying different planes with different purposes, all acting together. Uh, among the squads uh, that were uh, created at this moment, the most famous one is the Escadrille des Cigognes, uh, which would be symbolized by a bird, and in which the best pilots of the French military uh, could be found. Here you can see uh, several of them. Uh, so, for instance, uh, starting uh, to... Uh, so, second from the left is uh, Guinmer, Third is René Dorme, 
uh, and fourth is Alfred Hurtaud. Uh, three examples of uh, different style of piloting, different path towards aviation. Uh, but you can see on uh, this photography that um, these men embody a new uh, type, new archetype of fighter. Uh, you don't see them painted as uh, greedy, strong, uh, and uh, enduring uh, French soldier uh, in the trench as poilu. Instead, uh, you see that they have quite a laid-back attitude uh, with their hands uh, in their pockets. Uh, Guinemer has uh, his hair uh, quite messy compared to uh, the others. And you can see that they have uh, uniforms who back then were, were regarded as uh, slightly outrageous uh, for the military hierarchy with a very tight uh, waistcoat and uh, very high uh, boots. That's because uh, as uh, pilots, uh, they were separate from the rest of the troops. Uh, they would not uh, sleep uh, in the front lines, in the trenches, obviously. They would sleep uh, in the, uh, by the airfield and they would have access to actual uh, everyday comfort, such as better meals, uh, better uh, living conditions, uh, better clothing as well, and not having to uh, spend uh, their days uh, in the trench in the hell of Verdun. And uh, also, uh, being able not to uh, fly when the weather would not allow it, which is something that uh, made them to be regarded as uh, privileged, uh, especially since uh, the public kept uh, the passion for pilots. You can see that the lithography is signed like it would be signed uh, by uh, a rock star, uh, but these men are not rock stars, they're, uh, they're actually soldiers. And it's something that uh, drove many, many soldiers to apply to have a spot in aviation. It was a transfer that was uh, very uh, hard uh, to obtain, and uh, it was something that was not meant for everybody, because uh, many, many uh, wannabe pilots uh, quit uh, flying school after uh, a couple of days when they realized that uh, there was nothing easy about flying a plane and that it could be something very, very scary and uh, something that would give them so much terror that they would rather go back to the trenches. Uh, nevertheless, uh, this cliche, according to which uh, the, the pilots were uh, privileged, uh, just doesn't hold, because when you look at uh, the rates of losses uh, compared between air forces and uh, infantry, you find that uh, you actually have a higher chance of dying uh, in the war, be it uh, killed by an enemy or by accident, when you're a pilot, uh, rather than when you're a, troop, uh, a land trooper. Meaning that the passenger, George Scott's uh, idea that death is always uh, in the plane, is always on board, this idea kept and stayed. So, to, uh, in order to understand uh, what was going on in the air war, uh, you have to uh, you have to figure you have to uh, figure it like this. So, uh, basically, the majority of the missions uh, carried out of the air missions carried out during uh, World War One are uh, recognition missions uh, in order to help the artillery or uh, observe the enemy's movements. Some of them are, uh, are about bombing. But uh, the most famous ones, of course, are the fighting missions, the ones in which you have to take down enemies' planes and air balloons from the sky. And with that, uh, you can have, uh, you can represent it in your mind, in your imagination, as an arm wrestling between the Allies and uh, the German uh, military, with each army coming up with a new plane uh, with much better performances which will tip the scale uh, in one or another uh, sense. So, for a quick recap, uh, Gauss's plane, uh, the one that uh, he equips with uh, machine gun shooting forward, is this one, the BB Newport. Olivier, est-ce que tu pourras couper à ce moment? Je vais la refaire. So, in order to uh, picture this arm wrestle between uh, the French 
the British and uh, the German uh, military, each of them coming up with uh, new planes uh, that tip the scale in one or another uh, direction. Uh, we can sum it up uh, by uh, reviewing uh, the most famous fighting planes of the war. It starts with the Fleo Fokker, the Fokker Eindecker 3. Eindecker meaning that it's a one-decker uh, plane. It's a plane that was nicknamed uh, the Bane, the Fleo, uh, by the French, because it's the first uh, German fighting plane that can shoot forward using uh, Fokker's synchronization uh, system, and it's the plane that takes down, for instance, uh, Adolf Pegu in August 1915. Uh, the French uh, response to that will be uh, the Bébé Nieuport, uh, perfected and in service starting in January 1916. Uh, the Bébé Nieuport is called the Baby uh, because it's a very, very uh, small uh, plane and also as a sign of affection. And it's the plane that allows uh, the Allies to effectively fight against uh, the, Fok the Fokker uh, Bane. And uh, it's the plane that will uh, eventually allow the Allies to win the, the air battle of Verdun. But to that, uh, the Germans, uh, as soon as the Battle of Verdun is uh, over, the Germans will answer with the Albatros D3 in November 1916. And uh, the scale will once again tip in the Germans' uh, favor. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, in the spring of 1918, the month was nicknamed uh, Bloody April by the, uh, by the Allied uh, pilots uh, because of uh, the destruction, the havoc wreck uh, on their forces by this Albatross D3. Uh, the answer uh, would only come in the summer of uh, 1917, uh, which is regarded as one of the moments of the peak of the glory of the Aces, with the SPADS uh, series. The SPADS, uh, the Société, uh, de la Société de Père du Saint. Uh, so you have the SPAD 7 and the SPAD uh, 13s, which you can see here. This one painted in yellow uh, because it was uh, Guinmer's uh, plane. The SPADs uh, stayed uh, as uh, one of the best uh, fighting planes of uh, World War I uh, and uh, were kept by the French military all the way to the victory in 1918. They were also sent to other fronts to equip uh, the Greek military, the, the Italian military, etc., etc. Uh, the SPAD is the plane in which uh, Guinmer uh, won his final uh, victories before being taken down on uh, September 11th, uh, 1915, in the sector of Paul Capel. And uh, the SPAD 13 had to face with uh, the last uh, creation of the German uh, fighting plane industry, the Dreidecker. The Dreidecker, the triple decker uh, plane was uh, piloted uh, most famously by Manfred von Reichthofen. Uh, but the Dreidecker, uh, as good of a plane uh, as it was, uh, was not uh, a decisive factor in uh, tipping the final scale of uh, the air war. What happened is that uh, the number of planes uh, flying in the sky, the number of pilots, uh, increased exponentially uh, during the war and uh, you have uh, thousands of planes uh, flying in Europe at the end of the war, uh, whereas it was uh, mere dozens of or maybe hundreds uh, in the beginning, meaning that there are more and more air uh, skirmishes and battle. Uh, basically, at the beginning of the war, you had to fly for uh, hours, uh, days, or even weeks before coming across an actual uh, target. But in the end of the war, uh, you have uh, victories every, literally every day. Uh, you have uh, pilots killed every day because uh, to keep up with uh, the increasing of uh, the aircraft production uh, and uh, the need for uh, a stronger uh, air force, uh, all armies are training uh, pilots uh, more and more quickly and sending very inexperienced uh, pilots uh, on the battlefield, making them very easy targets for the most experienced aces. And this is how, at the end of the war, you have uh, very regularly 
uh, actual air battles with huge concentrations of planes. But what happens is that uh, by the summer of 1918, uh, Germany is being uh, suffocated by the Allied blockade. There is no more uh, gas uh, coming into Germany, meaning they have to ration it. And sometimes that goes in, that goes as far as uh, pumping uh, the gas out of uh, planes that have been downed uh, in order to save up as much as possible, meaning that at the end of the war, the Allies have achieved total air uh, supremacy and there is no more hope for uh, the German Luftwaffe. Uh, as a symbol of that, Manfred von Richthofen was uh, taken down in the beginning of the summer 1918, and uh, there was uh, no more pilot in uh, the German military able to inspire as much how as uh, the Red Baron. But we will talk about uh, the uh, cult of aces and the heroics about uh, the air war in World War I in our next episode. Thank you very much. Bonjour, everybody, and welcome to part three of uh, our series about the making of new heroism in World War I. And part three, we are going to talk about how the air heroes were made during World War I. We've talked about how uh, air war was invented, how sportsmen came to be um, uh, fighters. And now we are going to talk about uh, this mix of culture that will emerge and create a new figure around uh, the idea of the air hero, which is a heroism that can be quite distinguished uh, from the heroism of other uh, fighting figures. Indeed, uh, as, a, uh, as an airman, uh, you can boast about a very specific set of skills, uh, you can boast about a very specific role in the war. You can boast about being a front figure of modernity. And uh, also, you can uh, carry with you uh, elements of your own figure, uh, by which I mean that uh, the, the attitude of uh, air heroes of World War I is also determined by their previous background, meaning that it's uh, a mix between uh, sportsmen and uh, sporting customs, sport ethics, and uh, on the other hand, it draws from military culture, uh, especially since many pilots uh, used to be cavalry officers, meaning that they come from a weapon, uh, they come from a part of the army that's much more aristocratic, uh, with uh, much more people belonging to the nobility, and uh, they will carry on also this imagination uh, about uh, being knights, about hunting into uh, the air culture of World War One. So in France, this making of air heroes, what we can call uh, hero factories, uh, can be uh, summed up as revolving around this man, Jacques Joseph Philippe Romanet, uh, aka Jacques Mortan, his pen name. Uh, Jacques Mortan was uh, originally trained as a history teacher and later on became a sports journalist uh, start, starting uh, reporting about uh, many different sports and uh, uh, progressively over the Belle Epoque, specializing in uh, mechanic sports, uh, especially aviation. And Jacques Mortan uh, fought uh, in the, was uh, drafted into the military in the beginning of the war, uh, during which he lost his brother, and he spent time at the Camp Retranché de Paris, uh, meaning he was part of the air section of uh, the defenses of Paris. Uh, in this context, he met uh, with other uh, uh, pilots and aviators, and uh, started uh, started corresponding to the press about uh, the exploits that he would witness uh, in his uh, military service. And uh, later on, he would uh, build up more and more network uh, within uh, the, the French uh, air forces, uh, leading to, uh, in November 1916, him being honorably discharged from the military uh, to be allowed to uh, create a magazine called The Air War Illustrated, La Guerre Aérienne Illustrée in French, which was a weekly issue, uh, around 16 pages uh, per issue and uh, over 110 
issues between 1916 and uh, 1919. And uh, it was a newspaper that would uh, not only uh, let the public know about the air heroes, uh, you know, with everything that you can find in sport issues, but applied to military figures, uh, meaning interviews, uh, um, signed pictures, uh, stuff to collect. Uh, he would also publish each week an updated uh, scoreboard of uh, aviators, uh, you know, with um, the, the ranking of uh, the best uh, fighters. He would also advocate uh, for uh, better uh, living conditions for the pilots, uh, meaning also more machines, uh, more training, uh, also more consideration from the high command. And uh, he would also try to draw light on uh, the on the lesser known air fighters, uh, meaning uh, the ones uh, maneuvering the machine guns, uh, the air observers, or uh, the bombers, or uh, the balloon uh, the balloon men. Uh, all of which uh, was all of which had the effect of uh, making him uh, the manager of uh, the official uh, air newspaper of the French military, meaning that he would know. Uh, all the uh, aviators, and uh, it would have uh, very uh, extended, extensive networks, both uh, among the pilots, but also among uh, the constructors, and also among uh, the political figures that would advocate for a further development of uh, the air forces. And uh, that led him to uh, going out of the war, having become uh, one of the leading experts in the domain of aviation, someone uh, whose books are uh, very widely uh, published and read, somebody that uh, can have access to most uh, famous air uh, figures and someone uh, that is a key in making, uh, new, uh, making an aviators into a specific heroic figure. So now let's talk about uh, a bunch of these figures. Some of them uh, created uh, by Jacques Mortan and other uh, press. Some of them uh, created by the society, the French society in general. Because some of them became uh, universally known figures beyond the circles of aviation. Uh, but to understand more uh, about what La Guerre Aérienne Illustrée is about, uh, let's show you uh, one of their most striking uh, double pages. So you can see that it's a press uh, that um, uses modern techniques of uh, printing uh, images uh, in order to uh, give back the scenography, uh, the motion, the dynamics of uh, the action. It's something that's uh, very common uh, at this moment because this is the golden age of uh, printing press. Uh, most newspapers back then have uh, much more audience uh, than today. Uh, many newspapers in Paris, for instance, print 1 million copies per day. And uh, they also use uh, new processes, you know, to, uh, to put photographies and illustrations in the newspaper. And the idea is to, uh, to have appealing, compelling uh, images that will uh, give back the impression of movement, uh, the impression of modernity, and will attract, of course, be more appealing to the public. So in here we have uh, something uh, that was not drawn uh, by uh, Jacques Mortan's uh, team. Uh, on the opposite, it's something sent by uh, a pilot from the front lines. Something that Jacques Mortan can boast about is that uh, he can publish letters and testimonies firsthand from aviators themselves. Now here we have something that's uh, obviously uh, dramatized. We see that it's like uh, it's like a theater of shadow. So due to the numerization, uh, the picture is uh, reversed. We're actually supposed to read it. Uh, not um, from uh, left to right, but from right to left. And it's a three picture image corresponding to a three uh, motion action. So this is a pilot uh, who noticed that uh, sometimes he would see his own face in, uh, the, in the, the plane's mirror. And uh, he noticed that he had very striking expressions. So uh, he used uh, the camera that uh, they would take on board to uh, to take pictures of the enemy. He used it to take pictures of himself. Uh, 
meaning that we have here uh, actual air selfies from World War One, and we see that he is uh, putting himself in scene, he is staging himself as to be a very focused, dedicated, decisive fighting figure, because this is what uh, he perceives uh, is expected of him, and uh, this is the attitude that, fascin that will fascinate the public, this determination of the fighter, the killer, the one who defends uh, the sacred ground in the total war. So, uh, on uh, your right, uh, the image in which he's frowning uh, is uh, the expression that says uh, German spotted. The one in the middle is I will get you. And the one on the left is down you go with, uh, you can see this uh, unholy uh, joy, uh, this unholy rejoicing of him watching his enemy go down in flames. Now, indeed, uh, this uh, the main difference between uh, air heroes pre-war and air heroes during the war is that it's the relationship to death, because heroes uh, before the war are daredevils, uh, people who risk their own death uh, to entertain the public and to push the limits of human performance. Here we have heroes who kill, and the more they kill, uh, the more heroic uh, they are perceived. So uh, there is a very strange effect when you see the processes of uh, sports magazine applied to uh, killers and uh, fighters. So now let's talk about specific figures. We can talk, for instance, about Charles Nangessé. Charles Nangessé was uh, nicknamed Le Hussard de la Mort, something that I translate as Death Rider. Uh, he was a member of an elite cavalry uni unit, uh, the Hussard, uh, that would, uh, of course, be sent on range uh, mission in the beginning of the war during the movement phase. Uh, he is said to have uh, spotted a uh, German uh, automobile uh, with flags of the high command. Uh, so supposedly he chased uh, this automobile with his horse. Uh, he killed uh, everybody inside uh, the car with uh, his handgun and uh, brought back the car and the, the documents inside to uh, the French high command and got highly decorated for that. And uh, when uh, very soon it appeared that cavalry had become uh, useless in this war, uh, he obtained to be transferred in aviation. And uh, in aviation, he would be the first ace of the ace uh, because for a huge part of the war, he actually led uh, the scoreboard of uh, the French uh, pilots. Uh, but he had he was injured many 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 times, uh, most of the time surviving only by sheer luck, and that let Dinmer and later on Funk uh, go over him. But he finished the war with 43 confirmed victories, and he finished the war alive, which uh, is something to be noted, especially in the case of Nangesser, because as you can see with uh, the drawings on his plane, something that would uh, decorate his personal. Uh, plane. So you can see that you have the uh, trumpets of death, uh, a sign that will evoke the pirates, uh, a coffin, and a heart uh, surrounding all that, uh, suggesting that uh, Nangesse is a death lover. Something that is, in a sense, uh, because you have testimonies of him uh, being uh, with both uh, legs uh, in a cast, uh, suffering from uh, different wounds uh, received in combat. Well, he would threaten uh, the nurses and uh, demand to be carried to his plane because he wanted to go back fighting because he was so much uh, hooked into uh, the sensation, the sharpness that he perceived in uh, the fighting. Another figure, uh, much uh, better known than Nangesse, actually the most famous of the French aces uh, during this war, is Georges Guinmer. Georges Guinmer uh, is the uh, maybe the uh, most famous hero of uh, France in uh, World War One, and Guinmer was the ace of the ace uh, in uh, most of the year 1917 uh, all the way to 1918 when uh, René Fonck uh, passed uh, Guinmer's total. But uh, for a long time, Guinmer uh, was uh, undoubtedly the, the leader, ending the war with uh, 53 confirmed uh, victories. So uh, with Guinmer, you have uh, many of the elements of uh, an actual success story uh, of a hero uh, story, because Guinmer uh, had a very fragile and uh, slim uh, body, 
uh, he was quite uh, clumsy and uh, not very strong physically, meaning that uh, he was initially refused uh, in the military and uh, only by his perseverance, uh, because he was so stubborn, uh, he ended up being accepted. So he was affected to aviation because it was uh, uh, um, it was a unit in which uh, being uh, light and slim was actually an advantage. Uh, he had a very difficult training. Uh, he was called. Uh, he was nicknamed the machine breaker uh, because he would wreck so many planes uh, in the training. And uh, he was finally able to go uh, into battle. And uh, months after months, uh, he gained enough experience to be to become uh, a more and more efficient uh, fighter. Uh, and that coupled with uh, a, bo a boldness. Uh, so, sorry, uh, compared with an uncomparable, an uncomparable boldness uh, helped him become the ace of the ace. Uh, you have many testimonies of Guinmer attacking uh, an, uh, a group of several enemies with very few uh, chances of success and actually putting it out, uh, be it that he survives, that his plane is down, but he survives, uh, he actually wins uh, the combat, uh, or etc., etc. Uh, Guinmer was also a figure that had uh, kind of a virginal uh, sense uh, to it, uh, so, because this is France, this is a Catholic country, a country that's uh, at this moment uh, very much thinking about Joan of Arc. And there was this idea that uh, there was an angel like uh, figure uh, that would come uh, to rescue uh, France. Uh, for instance, although Guinmet had many affairs with uh, famous actresses, most of the press would uh, evoke. Uh, the purity, the chastity of uh, Guinmer because his mind was as pure as his heart and his body. Uh, he died uh, on September 11, 1917 in the Paul Capel sect sector. And uh, his death was mourned uh, and became a national tragedy. Uh, the, the French military, uh, in his last uh, citation, called him a legendary hero fallen from a sky of glory, the perfect embodiment of French uh, values and spirits. And um, his name was put in the French pantheon. Uh, a biography of him was commissioned to an official writer. And uh, you have stained glass, you have uh, plates, you have uh, a huge bunch of memorabilia that were uh, created at this moment and who had a big success. So everybody mourned uh, Guinmer and uh, that was in a sense uh, the sign that um, having heroes, making heroes in this war is something uh, with a double edge because yes, uh, making a hero will uh, inspire uh, fighters will embodies will embody the values of uh, aviation, but it's also risky in the sense that when your hero uh, dies, uh, the loss is uh, much uh, more heartfelt uh, than uh, it would be if you consider that it's only an individual figure. So we can talk also about René Dorme. So, by contrast with uh, Guinmer, uh, who had uh, this feeling of uh, angel, uh, René Dorme uh, was uh, the father or uh, the daddy, in the sense that uh, Jacques Mortan nicknamed him, uh, said that he, he just looked like a peaceful fisherman. Uh, he would look like uh, just a quiet French dad, although René Dorme died at the age of 23. Uh, René Dorme would also uh, very often carry a cane. Uh, he had uh, had broad shoulders and was quite short. Uh, so uh, for Jacques Mortan, who was a very close personal friend to René Dorme, uh, Dorme was uh, you know this uh, average uh, Frenchman, someone who uh, is kind and considerate and compassionate uh, in peacetime, but who will turn into a lion when it comes to uh, defending his country. Uh, René Dorme uh, died with uh, 23 uh, confirmed victories in April uh, 2019, uh, 17. And uh, so, unless so, René Dorme is uh, lesser known than uh, Guinmer, but uh, much more present in Erroir Illustrated, and uh, in uh, in the summer of 1917, Jacques Martin will actually issue a special uh, issue. 
uh, of uh, Error Illustrated, uh, dedicated to René Dorme with this picture as a front cover. Uh, with the um, uh, so signed by René Dorme, written "Faut pas s'en faire," which reads uh, "Don't uh, don't worry." And uh, so it was kind of a paper uh, funeral for René Dorme. Now, at the end of the war. Uh, all these figures uh, were either dead or uh, in a hospital, dead like Guinmer, uh, Andorn, or uh, in a hospital like Jean Navarre or uh, Charles Nangessé. Uh, but uh, a new figure would emerge in the end of the war and would be the final ace of the ace. I'm talking about René Fonck. So René Fonck uh, finished, survived the war and uh, finished it with Seven, an astounding total of 75 confirmed uh, victories, which is less than the official total of uh, the Red Baron, Manfred von Richthofen, but uh, a much more uh, reliable uh, figure. And uh, Funk would very often uh, say himself that uh, his non-confirmed victories uh, would uh, bear his total uh, all the way to uh, at least uh, 120. Uh, Funk uh, had started the war uh, quite early, around the same time as uh, Guinmer. And just like Guinmer, it was only a matter of uh, him being able to accumulate enough experience to so that at the end of the war, he would be the best pilot on the front lines. Um, his favorite uh, tactic uh, was uh, of flying very high uh, and uh, using his excellent sight uh, maintained by a uh, very sharp uh, diet and way of life to spot his enemies uh, from uh, very uh, far away. Then he would cut his engine and let his plane slide to uh, the very pr close proximity of uh, the enemy. And then he would use uh, his, his other talent uh, as a sharp shooter, he was an excellent marksman, to uh, take down the enemy uh, with only a couple uh, bullets. Funk uh, was nicknamed the Hunter. Uh, for his, uh, you know, his calmness, uh, his coolness in the act uh, of killing, uh, and also the Avenger, as you can see here. So this is the victory issue of uh, uh, Erroir Illustrated, the one of Christmas 1918. Uh, and so it features Funk with uh, the signs of cards, ace, spades, uh, diamonds and clubs, uh, you know, evoking the idea that he is the ace of the aces. And you see a bunch of uh, the pilots that Funk is supposed to have avenged with uh, his action. Uh, so Funk was uh, the final ace of the aces of the war. He was the one carrying uh, the air uh, flag at uh, the victory parade in 1919. And for La Guerre Illustrée, he was, uh, of course, uh, the best material in the end of the war. Here, for instance, uh, we have uh, the day of, uh, we have a montage uh, revolving around the day of uh, 21st of May uh, 1918, a day in which uh, Funk uh, won six uh, victories. So we have uh, the montage uh, indicating the hours in which Funk uh, got his victories. And this, the idea is that Funk kills at any hour he pleases. And so at the end of the war, for a conclusion, we can see that aviation has now new heroes. Uh, some heroes uh, who are still alive, like Funk, uh, Nangessé, or Vedrine. Some who are dead, like Garros, uh, like Guinmer, like Dorme. And all these heroes uh, have been uh, the result of the catalyzing of aviation uh, under the effect of the war. Because now planes uh, are much more numerous, planes uh, are much more uh, efficient, carry much more load, meaning that uh, aviation will uh, keep developing and many, many uh, military pilots will be recycled as uh, commercial uh, pilots, but they will uh, keep on uh, all this culture uh, created by the war, a culture that's a hybrid between sports, uh, military, uh, nobility, hunting, something that uh, gathered together technique, uh, culture and heroism, creating the new figure of the ace and shaping uh, the culture of aviation throughout the interwar period. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, leave us your questions and comments. See you soon!